Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, as Tudia said this morning, I'm standing in for uh, Anton Fall from the, um, from the SACO Secretariat at, uh, uh, at a rather late point. Um, we were informed that um, no official representative of the SACO Secretariat uh, will be able to attend here. Uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, ladies and gentlemen, you will not be able, really be able to tell after my presentation because there's no comparison possibility. Uh, but uh, I've got a couple of things to say, and the first one is that I can't resist the temptation to react to two things raised by Paul. Um, this morning, Daniel criticized me for not, uh, for not fully answering his uh, question and is uh, addressing his argument about uh, what is essentially the lack of power, he used the term supranationality in the regional secretariats. Let me say two things about um, the nature of our regional secretariats. Have you picked up in the, in the list uh, and, and in the report that, that, that Paul has given us, have you picked up how monitoring of compliance really takes place through government and political initiatives. Uh, I think he will, he will, he can, he can come back to this during the discussion time. The SADC Secretariat is well staffed and there are many very good technical people. And in certain areas, like in water and energy, they are better than in other areas. And they can, they can initiate and they can come up with studies, but ultimately compliance of the implementation of the obligations, in other words, of the regional integration activities of the program, is a government, is a government matter. And it's the same in SACU. Those institutions that we have, where the real powers are located, are platforms for articulating government interests. That is an institutional weakness, that is a design weakness, but it is also the reality of how we do business in our part of the world. It's also reflected in the thinking and the planning about the, about the tripartite FDA. Now, the second point is about formal dispute resolution. Going by the recent evidence, we are not going to see a resurrection of the SADC tribunal. And that doesn't surprise me because it sunk on the rock of human rights enforcement. All those cases, all those, con there were only two categories of cases before the SADC Tribunal. Labor issues brought by officials of the SADC Secretariat, disciplinary matters, they were fired without fair hearings and things like that. That was the one category, the biggest one. And the second one was about human rights issues. Um, the Zimbabwean cases, and even one or two other cases that really had a trade law potential were brought to the tribunal as human rights violations. Uh, my favorite example is the DRC truck driver case, and I've shared that with many of you before. This gentleman's truck, all the paperwork, I think the, 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 the uh, transport company was based in Botswana, but in any case, this truck was confiscated and everything on it at the DRC border uh, on the claim that the uh, paperwork was not in order counterclaim was, of course, that it was in order. And after several days and probably weeks there, uh, the owner of the truck tried to, um, to obtain a court order in, um, in, uh, in the DRC uh, to release the vehicle. That proved impossible. And he then started proceedings at the Sadak Tribunal, not on the basis of a violation of any of the protocols. And by the way, the protocol on the, t on the tribunal provided for individual private standing jurisdiction, local stand I wouldn't have been a problem. But the matter was brought as a human rights issue, uh, expropriation of property. Now, th if, if countries are not prepared to um, allow um, the uh, implementation and enforcement of human rights in their own jurisdiction through what they can very really easily add to their constitutions, there's no way that they're going to allow a regional court, a regional tribunal to enforce human rights. We will not see the resurrection of the SADC tribunal on this particular matter. The only chance will be if we, and I really, really hope that that can, 
that can come about is if the, um, if the understanding, the discussion about dispute resolution will be given a purely technical trade and regional integration content. By the way, Paul, there is an annex to the SADC trade protocol, the annex on dispute resolution. It's based on a panel procedure. It has been there for several years. Why is it not implemented? I want to leave it at, at that one, and then um, we can, we can um, very quickly go and have a look at, at SACO developments. Now, SACO, ladies and gentlemen, is, a, as we all know, and it is often claimed, the world's oldest functioning customs union. Uh, it means it predates the thinking about the GATT and, and the WTO by several decades, and that explains a very specific feature of it. In my book, SACO is very, very, very much a, um, a revenue sharing mechanism. And I think if we work through the list of activities presently on the table, on the agenda, it, we will probably see a movement towards uh, um, uh, uh, joint efforts, regional uh, work programs. There is a term here being used, the SACO work program. I will share that with you. But again, again, it is inspired by initiatives taken by the governments. There isn't a SACU voice effectively speaking on behalf of the collective. What happens and when do what doesn't happen um, depends on, on political initiatives from the member states and the council is the highest decision making body. Two weeks ago there was um, a summit again in Gamarone uh, and what I am going to share with you, ladies and gentlemen, is the communique which was issued after that, after that summit. It deals with a number of issues on the work program. Let me share it very quickly with, the, with you and I will make comments on one or two of the issues. First point is that SACU is now going to get a summit. And this was a communique of the summit. The summit will now be institutionalized the agreement will have to be amended in certain ways and those amendments will have to go to the national parliaments where there are constitutions requiring uh, parliamentary involvement and uh, that will, I believe, be the route that will be adopted in, in South Africa. Uh, amendments need to be ratified. What is the implication of that? It can take some time. So. <coughs> This communique lists as the most important one, and by the way, for me, from a technical legal point of view, the, the, the challenging or the interesting thing here is what will be the division of powers between the new summit and the old council? Which one will really have the clout? I didn't see the document, I didn't see the document, the recent document on the exact nature of the SACU summit, but uh, those that I did um, see some time ago really didn't take away the powers of the, of, the, of, the, of the council. So it is not as if the summit can override the council. The highest decision-making powers will still be exercised, it seems, I don't know, uh, by the council. Okay. Um, at this summit, the communique says the heads of state and government have recalled that, so at a certain date they've adopted the SACU work program. Now, the SACU work program originally had 12 items on that list. Five and now six areas have been identified as priority areas for the SACU work program. Now, let me mention the uh, areas to you and then we can together speculate on how the SACU work program is being implemented. The priority areas for the SACU work, work program are, not surprisingly, number one, regional industrial development policy. Review of the revenue sharing um, arrangement, also no surprise. Trade facilitation, number three, four, development of the SACU institutions, and then five, uh, a unified engagement in trade negotiations, and they have now added to this list a new priority area, um, which is trade in services and strengthening the capacity of the Secretariat. 
those two areas have been added. Ladies and gentlemen, the other um, second league, second team um, elements of the, of, the, of the work program, I mentioned that they are originally 12 have been put on that list, uh, are um, investigating financing options for cross-border projects, exploring the possibility of the review of the, SAC, of the 2002 SACU agreement, developing SACU positions and new generation issues, and developing a SACU trade and tariff policy, and so on. Now, we must recall that when the new SACU agreement was adopted in 2002, it entered into force in 2004, it did provide for political ambitions um, in the sense that it is stated there in the preamble that the new SACU will, will be based on democracy, um, dispute settlement, giving this idea that it's going to be a truly rules-based system uh, and the democracy and the values of democracy will prevail. I don't quite know how regional uh, organizations become bastions of democracy. It must be a sui generis interpretation, but I have a suspicion that it has to do with the equality between states. Uh, not about elections and the uh, general population having a say in what happens there. And then it provided for n a new range of institutions. Um, the old institutions carried on, the old institutions under the 69 agreement, uh, like the council and the commission. What was added was the secretariat. It didn't have a secretariat before. Secretariat has no executive powers and then the tribunal and the tariff board and national bodies were provided for. They have never been established. One of the matters being reported here is um, that there is a continuation in the effort to, um, to establish the tariff board and the national bodies. These two must go hand in hand. Why is that so problematical? Well. Very simply, ladies and gentlemen, think of what ITAC is doing, the International Trade Administration Commission, based in Pretoria. It has jurisdiction for the whole SACU territory. Uh, it has been functioning for many, many, many decades. Adopting and implementing a completely new dispensation where trade remedies will be implemented through regional institution in terms of WTO rules and requirements where four of the five countries have got no experience and capacity, really, on, on anti-dumping, countervailing, and safeguards. That's a major, major exercise in reconstructing a regional arrangement, which has really worked quite differently in the past. So I'm not very hopeful that we are going to see major developments in this area, simply by, uh, uh, as a consequence of the nature of the animal, too. It has major technical and, and capacity implications and, of course, serious, serious implications of for how the protection of the common external tariff uh, will be taken and then how those investigations will be conducted. Let me say one or two things about SACU's debate on industrial development for the members of that organization. Now, fortunately, we have people in the audience here who have been um, contracted to, um, to undertake this study, and they will be able to tell us more, I, I believe. But um, the regional industrial policy, the work program for that one says, um, there are eight priority sectors with potential cross-border collaboration uh, implications. Textile, clothing, and apparel, number one agro-processing, mineral beneficiation, leather and leather products, automotive, including automotive components, energy, arts and crafts, and support services for these like um, communication, ICT, and so on. The heads of state of government further noted 
that out of these eight areas, agro-processing and the automotive sector will be prioritized. Again, a study will be undertaken. A study will be undertaken and um, we will have to wait and see what will come out of, out of this initiative. Uh, it is recognized that competition policy must be given more attention as part of this effort. Then very briefly, ladies and gentlemen, a number of other items which are figuring on the report list uh, and being mentioned in this communique. The revenue sharing arrangement. We all know that under the, um, the 2002 SACO agreement, when the new revenue sharing arrangement um, was implemented, that it has very important, substantial and direct beneficial consequences for the BLNS countries. It is public knowledge that Lesotho and Swaziland are highly dependent on those revenue sources and it is also public knowledge that there are many unhappy souls in the Republic of South Africa about the uh, way that this has panned out. Uh, the sentiments for renewing or for reviewing, for taking a critical look again at uh, that revenue sharing formula comes from mainly from this country. I um, think that is logical. And in this debate which has been going on for some time, and there was a study completed in 2011 but not yet implemented, it's being still being discussed, uh, the council uh, pointed out, or documents pointed out that um, some, some principles must be recognized when we tamper with the revenue sharing formula. Now just listen to the inherent consistency of these principles. No member should be made worse off than what obtains under the current revenue sharing arrangement. Revenue shares should be equitable taking into account political and socio-economic considerations. Revenue shares allocations should be developmental and not redistributive in nature. The revenue sharing arrangement should promote economic convergence. The revenue sharing should minimize volatility and should be aligned to the SACU vision and mission. In this, there's a subtext, and that subtext is how to redirect the spending of the revenue away from direct budget support, or it's not really called budget support, it simply goes to the member states as an entitlement under the agreement to do with whatever they want to do as sovereign states after that, to linking it to regional develop or a SACU regional developmental um, um, criteria or priorities and maybe we will see, I don't know, maybe the development and the adoption of a regional industrial program for SACU may see some linkages here, I don't know. Um, that debate is still going on. The management of the revenue pool has also been mentioned Trade facilitation has been mentioned with some breakdown in detail there. I do not want to say much more about that. It, it is on the agenda. And then um, practical issues, ladies and gentlemen, about border management and joint legislative arrangements. I travel to Namibia many, many times a year. And my friend David van Wyk sitting on the other end of this room can confirm that. It has been striking how over the years, if you cross the border at Narkop or at Fjolstrif, Nord Uwe, how the, um, the controls at those borders have been increased. There are many, many agencies present there. Um, up to recently, I never knew that, you, that there were controls about fuel being taken across the border. 
I can't buy diesel for my buck here on this side and take it across the border, and vice versa. There are many, many controls there. I haven't got a clear understanding of on, 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 on what all of them are, are based, but um, the, heads, uh, the, the heads of state in this communique of state and government emphasize that the application of sim similar customs and excise legislation is essential to facilitate trade as well as to combat illicit trade in the customs union. These are legitimate concerns. These are legitimate concerns. But there are no SACU bodies to do so. So the implementation formula, again, just as in SADC, is a decentralized one. It has to be done by the member states. If the member states don't perform, then what do you do? You adopt joint legislation and, 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 and international legal instruments. Then, of course, after that, you will encounter the problem which was identified by Paul, and w that is what happens if the member states don't implement or don't want to implement those regional legal institutions. That debate, that challenge, fairly on the agenda in SACU as well. Then it goes on to mention the uh, ongoing institutional issues like the tribunal, the, the, na the, uh, the, the, the tariff board, the national bodies, and the common negotiating mechanism. There is an article in the SACO agreement, I think it's Article 31, which right from the beginning emphasized, given the nature of the common external tariff and so on, that there must be uh, a common negotiating mechanism. And it was always understood to be some type of institutional arrangement. It didn't come off the ground, and what we now have is a sort of understanding, not an institution, but an understanding that the governments engage jointly in, in trade negotiations. That is as far as that one goes, and they undertake to pursue their trade negotiations with third parties in a unified manner, and then it concludes with aptly that very important issue, namely that the heads of state and government noted with satisfaction that the construction of the SACO headquarters building in Windhoek has commenced and is anticipated to be completed in November 2013. I have learned that that contract was given to a Chinese company. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.